Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, so welcome to the RNA Seq Analysis Workshop Part One. I'm Nikita, and I'll be leading the workshop today. Um, I just briefly have a few few slides to go over before we start the workshop. Um, and there will be some interactive parts as well. So I really encourage you to participate in them. Um, okay, so let's see if this works. Okay, yes, first of all, I would like to start off by acknowledging that we are on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And welcome to the Precision Health rna Seek Workshop. Um, I'm Nikita, as I mentioned before, I am a third year PhD candidate in the medical genetics program. Um, I work with placental R small RNA data, and I'm looking at uh, building a catalog of all of these small RNAs um, within the human placenta, normative human placenta, as well as looking at any correlations with DNA methylation. We have two workshop TAs today, uh, the lovely Nehru's and Alejandro. So. Um, I think Nerys is here in person, so I just like her to introduce herself on chat if she can. Um, if not, that's fine. We can hear from her later. And Alejandro, if you would just like to say a few words about yourself, um, he's our TA on Zoom, and so he'll be answering all the questions on Zoom and monitoring the chat over there. Should I mute myself or is Nerus talking there? Yes. All right. Um, mm, no, so can you hear me? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Oh, all right. <laughs> um, yeah, so my name is Alejandro. I'm a um, third year. Um, uh, PhD candidate as well in the Wasserman lab. And I've been working extensively with RNA-seq, spe specifically on the topic of um, cardiomyocyte differentiation. So yeah, if you have any questions about the um, workshop, just let me know in the Zoom chat and I'll be taking care of the questions. Thank you, Alejandro. And um, everything that's made available here will be online. I am assuming that everyone has read through the to do like pre workshop to do documents and have downloaded the necessary expression file and the phenotype file, as well as the workshop RMDs. Um, but once we're done with the workshop, everything along with these slides will be available on the Precision Health Bootcamp GitHub. So then part one, which is right now, uh, will be running for two hours and we'll be starting with raw expression data and working our way towards process and normalized data. And afterwards, with a little break, we'll be going from normalized data to pathway enrichment. And so given that this is a basic introductory analysis to RNA-seq, um, I will not be like going through any specific functions that might apply to your own data set, which might have some nuances. So there's going to be a standard workflow of RNA-seq. So um, please do um, like, yeah, if you do have like specific questions about your data, please do contact us later as we want to focus basically on just the standard workflow. Okay, just a few housekeeping rules before we get started. This is my first time running this workshop in person or in hybrid. So I really um, would like appreciate, um, and it would mean a lot to me if you would be patient with me as I work through. And given that um, I'm in person, like it's a hybrid thing, I'm sharing my entire screen here. So I don't have my notes on my computer. I have them as printouts next to me. So it might um, make me a little bit slow. And I just appreciate that you're um, taking that on board. This is a welcoming space. So if you don't feel comfortable asking questions, um, you can do uh, like in person, there are a number of ways you can do so. Mm -hmm. So in person, you can directly like speak up or raise your hand, or you can just flag our TNA rules and ask her directly if you don't wanna ask me. Online, you can speak up 
or you can raise your hand or type in the chat or message Alejandro privately. Um, just do whatever you feel comfortable with. This is, given that it's quite a long workshop, if you learn better by just sitting through and seeing how the code works, that's totally okay. You don't have to code along with me. Um, everything is going to be available with the worksheet, the completed sheets as well later on, um, which will be uploaded. So again, um, choose a learning method that suits your needs best. Um, like I mentioned before, Nerys will be helping out in person. Alejandro is um, online on Zoom. So given that this is an intermediary workshop, I assume that all of you some, have some basic working knowledge of R. So we will be using the tidyworks way of writing code and not base R. Um, I will only be explaining the specific functions that um, I use in my workflow for this um, analysis and not going into like, you know, the most common ways of how we write code in tidyworks, but I might like just explain a little bit here and there. Okay. And I mentioned before, like all of the uh, workshop material is like will be made available on the GitHub. Um, and I, you can like just basically, you'll have the link so you can just go. And the uh, work, the folder is called the Applied RNA Seq Workshop folder. Okay, so as I mentioned at the start, I really do encourage participation. I want this to be more of a discussion and not a lecture. There are no wrong answers. A, it's just, you know, whatever you, whatever question you have, just please feel free um, to ask and to tempt you. I have some special things here with me. So I attended the R3 conference last week in Washington, DC, and I specifically got these, okay, I'll show these to the people on Zoom, these specific like R Studio um, R package hex stickers, which if you're familiar with R, you know how much of a collector's item they are. So if you answer a question, even if it's wrong, you get a sticker, okay? So I have five R Studio, two ggplot, dplyr, tidyverse, R markdown, and shiny stickers. And this, these R Studio ones are collector's items now because R Studio has changed their company name to Posit so you will never get be getting these stickers ever again. This is your last chance, okay? So answer a question, get a sticker. Uh, this is for Zoom participants as well. Um, Alejandro, if you could monitor the people who answer these questions, we can get their contact information and send those stickers off to them. Okay, so this is a poll that I would all like you to go to. I'll just open it up on my browser as well. Um, Okay, so I will be launching it. So this is just to get an idea of um, basically like what we have, uh, just an idea of like, you know, the experience that we have here, like all the students that we have participating and I will run the poll. So you should be able to input some answers now. Okay, eight responses so far. Okay, it looks like in general, the majority is like, this is your very first introduction to RNAC. Some of you have worked with it and some of you have actually done some tutorials. So this will, okay. I'm gonna go to the next question now. So why are you here at this workshop? Okay, perfect. This makes sense. Um, I love that there are some people here just for fun. Um, 
I really applaud that. And um, okay, let's see if the people who already do know some RNAC can get something new out of this. Okay, cool. So I will stop this and head back to our slides. Okay. So raw sequencing data. This is where we're going to start off with now. Um, as I said, this presentation, I will um, start off like a little bit of the first steps over here, and then we'll move into our studio. Um, I think for those who did attend the R Studio workshop before, like the intro to R, we will be working on our local R Studio and R because my sockeye hasn't been working that well. So, um, does everyone have R installed on their local machine as well as R Studio? Perfect. Okay, that's great. Um, Alejandro, could you let me know if um, there are any people who don't have our studio on their local um, desktop on Zoom? Yeah, no, nobody seems to be saying anything on the chat, but can you maybe create a poll in the in the Zoom? I don't know if that's easy to do. I've seen some hmm. presentations do that. Okay. Um, uh, how about the people who don't have our studio? Could you just raise your hand? Because everyone here in the room does have it installed. Do we see any hands up? Okay, I'm just going to assume that everyone has our studio installed on their desktop then. Yeah, I don't see hands up in, in okay. Zoom either. Okay. Oh no, okay. Um, I will, I will, yes. Um, so I still have a few slides to run through, so you do have a little bit of time, but yes, okay. Okay, so we'll start with our introduction to sequencing data. So question number one, in what format or extension do you usually obtain sequencing data? On Zoom, you can raise your hand, just speak up, in person, you can go ahead. Um, FASTQ. Yes, FASTQ file. Okay, FASTQC is a software that you use to analyze the FASTQ file. Okay, so it is a FASTQ file. So what we see over here is this is usually how you would see every single sequence entry within a FASTQ file or your sequencing file. So you, at, the at the top, you have an identifier, then you have your actual sequence. Then you just have a little bit of a filler where um, it's just something that is output by the actual machine. And then you have something called as your FRED quality scores. Now, the higher the FRED score, the better the value of, or value, no, the better the um, eh, quality, basically, of that sequence. So um, in that case, I won't be going through these um, steps of how a fast code file looks what like a bit more on this you can find um on my fast queue to bam um step like separate document which i'll also add to the um github but yes sorry martin okay so basically um it is like there are two ways you can look at fred score so usually it's on a scale of 40 so anything um basically it actually really depends so if you have low anything up you can consider anything about 20 to be good in certain cases where you have really really bad quality data but again the higher you go towards 40 the better and um yeah it really again depends on the quality of the data you put into your sequencing yeah um okay so then moving on. So you got your sequencing files from the center. What do you do next? What's the general step that you would do next? Yes? Perfect, yes. So what we do is trimming, quality control, and then alignment to the genome. So. What that means is um, how like the FASTQC software that um, 
one of the participants in person mentioned is a software that you can put your raw fosky file in, look at a few quality control checks, you know, um, the distribution of nucleotides, the FRED quality score, and accordingly, you can only select the ones that you want, like with a higher FRED quality that you would want. You can also, um, if the sequencing center does not already take off or trim the adapters and the primers that you have, you can do that as well. So there's um, like software such as Cut Adapt and Trimomatic, but all of this needs to be done in terminal in Linux. Um, and then the last bit is basically aligning your FASTQ sequence file to the actual reference genome. For this, you need to download the reference genome file, which is a FASTA file, as well as a reference annotation file, which stores all of your gene, like gene sequence data. So for um, just the human gene, human genome, it will be human genes. Now, look, because I look at small RNA data, a lot of the small RNA genes are not included in these annotation files. So I download them specifically from the websites that uh, have these sequence data available. And it is also recommended that when you do download this genome file um, from whichever website, that you download the annotation file from that website itself. Because while the information might be the same, the way that it is written might be a little different, meaning that if you download it from ENCODE, they might code the chromosome as chromosome 1, whereas if you get it from Ensemble, it might just be CHR1. So it's just a general practice that wherever you get your genome file from, get your annotation file from the same exact website. It just saves a lot of trouble, trust me, because I tried to do it like the comprehensive way and it just didn't work. Okay, so what is an aligned FASTQ file called? And then bonus sticker, two stickers for whoever knows the full form of the extension of that file. Yes? It's a BAM file, yes. Do you know the um, full form of BAM? And people on Zoom, please do keep writing in the chat. The chat is recorded, so I will be giving out stickers to pe people who do answer in the chat as well. Sorry. Yes, almost close. So you get two stickers. It is a binary alignment map file, okay? So BAM is a computer readable format. So when you actually like look at this within your console, you're just gonna see a bunch of like symbols and letters and numbers. We don't, you know, we can't read it. And there's usually no reason to, if you have done all of your trimming steps properly, you don't need to look at this BAM file, but you can convert this BAM file into a human readable format. Does anyone know the name of that? No, but close. You'll still get a sticker. It can be in the .txt extension if you want. Alejandro, anyone on Zoom answering? Uh, not for this slide. No? Okay. Oh, someone just answer. Carly, of course. I'm writing down their name. Okay. Who said? Okay, yes, it is a SAM file. So it's a sequence alignment map. So this file actually um, produces your BAM file data into a human readable. So you can actually see the gene name, you can see the sequence, a lot of stuff. The only thing is it's a very, very big file because as you can see, a binary file is not gonna have a lot of, um, it's not gonna be a huge file. SAM is a huge file. So if there's something you really need to go and see, like you can definitely do that, but I would recommend, as long as you don't need that file, just delete it unless you have like a lot of storage available. Okay, cool. So I am just going to be keep, keeping some stickers here so that I don't forget who to give it to. Okay, CPs are done. Okay, cool. And then this is where we'll kind of be transitioning into our, our studio. So, um, to let's say like we have our BAM file now. So the people who did do the pre-workshop to do's, you will have seen that there was a BAM file that I asked you to download from the Human Genome Project. It was just um, a uh, file, like the sequence exome file of a female of British descent. And given that because it was a very big file, like some 500 MBs, I did not have it on my GitHub. But 
what we see here is now if we we will be using the here package in R, which uh, really allows you to do your um, like file management a lot better. And then if using here, it doesn't actually default to the root folder that you have downloaded. Um, you can set your file path as like within double inverted commas. We read in the R subread package, and then we just uh, use this function called as feature counts, which over here, I'll just explain the syntax a little bit because people might not have known about the here um, package. So we use, we're telling R that from the here package, we want to use the here function because there is a base R function called as here as well. So we have to specify it's from the here package. We want to go within the data folder and then we want to read in the whatever the name of the BAM file is. The BAM file is named this ag 00097map blah 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 dot BAM. And then anot inbuilt means the inbuilt annotation. So you can have your own um so feature counts actually has a few of the genomes loaded in already. If not, if the, it doesn't have the genome you want, you can specifically download whichever one you want and then feed it in. So over here, I just put AG19 because this um, specific um, BAM file was actually aligned to AG19, which is the previous version of the genome. Does anyone know? Okay, like just random question. Does anyone know which is the current version of the human genome? Yes. Yes. Okay. Martin, you're getting a lot of stickers. So it's the AG38. But of course, that depends on what your reference genome is. If it's the mouse one, there is also a new mouse reference genome that came up maybe two months ago. So do check that out. Um, and then again, is paired in. So this was actually paired in sequencing. Yes. No, I will be going. I'm just explaining this right now. Yes, yes. Um, so is paired in true, you can put in true or false depending upon if it's paired in sequencing or not. And so this is basically um, the image over here is the output that you get when you run this command. It might take a little bit of time to run if you're doing it, you don't have to do it. I do have it saved as an um, R object file, which we can load in, but this is just for demonstration purposes. We are not going to be using this file anywhere further. Okay. Uh, in Zoom, uh, from Juan. Hey, Nikita, can I ask a question? Yes, sure. So for the reference genomes, how translatable is this to if you're doing bacterial work, like aligning to a bacterial reference genome? Is this a good pipeline to follow for this or a, not really? Okay, so... um. I haven't worked with bacterial sequences before, so I don't know the nuances that might go on in these sequences, but generally the workflow that I'm showing you over here, like the R subree feature counts is a standard workflow you can do to get counts. Now, the thing is feature counts has maybe about, um, like it has a lot of arguments. Also, this is an R package. So for bacterial sequences, um, I you could also go down the, terminal and Linux way and use star or bow tie too, which is also something I've done. They give you a lot more flexibility in the terms of the arguments and the flags that you can apply. So you can be as precise as possible. The only caveat being that when you're doing these kinds of things, you have to be very certain of the parameters you're applying, because if you just apply the default parameters, those do work, they're default for a reason. But then when you go into specifics, you have to carefully look at each single parameter that they have and put in the right um, argument. So when it comes to bacterial sequences, if you think that for some reason this might not work, then I would suggest that you look into star and bow tie. Um, again, like I mentioned, like they, I have a whole separate document on how to do this within Linux, which I will put up later on as well. And hopefully that might help you. Um, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, perfect. Yes. Yes. E. coli or the great genome and great annotation stuff. So what you're referencing in feature counts is ETF and a fast day. Yes. Now, if you're working on some bacteria without a reference genome, none of this would. Yes. So it depends on the bacteria 
is it a single bacteria? Is it a mixture of bacteria? Those questions will change this study. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you were muted or not, but I'll just, uh, okay. Yeah, I was just, uh, Phil over here was just saying, it really depends on the reference genome that you have as well. Um, if it's like present in a specific format, if it's not, if it's a big genome, if it's a small one. So those are like things you can, like you'll, uh, you can definitely find the answers too. You just have to know the keywords to Google and put into Stack Overflow or Biostars. Okay. Um, I think we can move on. So. Yes, so we use the feature counts and okay, so we got this, you know, we got this whole thing. And then when you actually look at this aligned um, object that we have, it's a list. It has, I forgot to show it over here, but we can see it within R when we move to R Studio. So it's basically has like, I think four different data frames within that. And to get the counts, we actually just, you can name your like data frame or object, whatever you want want and then from within the aligned data frame we call out the counts data frame and then when you actually look at the counts this is what they look like so this is kind of what you would expect you know a simple data frame with rows where you have the genes and then the call so no sorry so each row over here is a gene and this is the count within that sample for that gene and so this is just one sample. So you can imagine when you have like 50 or 100, 200 samples, you have to do this like quite, like you have to do it, um, you don't have to do it one by one, you can do it in parallel, but then you have to write a function to do so. So this is just for the one file, but you basically put in the same exact functions, wrap it in a for loop if you want, or um, whichever method is comfortable for you to do the process reiteratively. Okay, is everyone with me so far? Yeah? Okay, perfect. So now we'll be moving on to our studio. I'll just stop sharing this. Okay, Um, cause I have everyone on Zoom over here right now. Um, Does anyone have any questions? Cause I can see everyone right now. No? Okay, perfect. So, all the code you've given us up till now is how we can format, like change the file type, format it so that we can do the analysis. Yes. And it should be pretty straightforward. Like, if we're using our own data, we just kind of substitute like, the path and the folders we need, and, but the formula is pretty much. Yes. So, what I'm giving right now is the very standard parameters that you would use, right? So, like, you can obviously go have a deep dive and check out the ones that you want. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So can everyone see this? You can see it on the screen. It should be good. Okay. So then um, if everyone, does everyone first of all have their worksheets and then within the actual um, data folder have at least, um, what do you call it? Where did it go? the EDAT and the PDAT files? Uh, I don't have the worksheet. No? No. Okay. I don't have the files. Okay. Um, and we can do that, I don't have the worksheet. Okay, it's if you, um, yeah, nearest could you? Um, and if not, okay, if people don't have it, um, I you know what, I'll share the Google Drive link where you can download everything as well as the GitHub repo. Okay, perfect, thank you, Phil. So you can either, if your GitHub is not working for some reason, you can download it from Google Drive, but you can just fork the repo and then clone it or just clone it directly. And you should get everything that I see over here. And your root folder should have all of these folders over here, as well as a few different files. So we're going to go, you might not have this PHP part one files, but we're just gonna go within scripts and then open up part one worksheet.rmd, not the MD file. And that's what I have open over here. Okay, so here I just have a disclaimer that if you are working on software or whatever, you will have to actually check um, where your library or your packages are being loaded from. Now, um, if you have a custom library location, you can just put it, um, like read it in, adjust in double inverted commas, just like I have over here. 
Um, but over here, I'm just going to be using my default um, package location. So you should have all of these packages installed. Just going to run that now. And then this is the, um, this is basically what I was talking about before. So if I, let's see if this works. So I'm going to just run this over here. You don't need to do it. Okay, it does not have this file. It didn't copy over, but anyway. So if I read this in, so basically when you run this align command here, this is what you're going to get. And then as I mentioned, there is a count stock uh, data frame over here. And if you just do this, this is what you're going to see. So again, this is just for the one sample um, and you can do it in R, you can do it in Linux, however you want it to be. Is everyone with me so far? Okay, this was just for demonstration purposes. If it doesn't work, it's okay. You can do it on your own later. Everything is um, stored in the GitHub folder. No, no, not. Okay, now we will actually start reading in our data. So um, we will be using a data frets from GEO. So GEO is the gene expression omnibus, which is a repository where you can upload your data. And it is very good practice when you publish a paper and have any data that you do so and make it publicly available. So the GEO ID or the accession that we have is this GSE 157103. Um, you might not have this within your worksheet. I just wrote it down here, but you can go ahead and write this in your actual R Studio now. If you're working through, if you're not, if you're just observing, that's totally fine. Um, so yeah, so the thing is usually when you're downloading data from anywhere, it is going to be in a format that is not exactly what you want it to be. There are gonna be spaces within the column names, which gives us a lot of errors. It's not gonna be in a tidy format, which is what, what we are used to working with. So what I've um, done is I've actually downloaded this data set. I formatted it. So uh, format the expression data set as well as the phenotype file or the clinical file so that it's easier for everyone to use within this workshop. But if you want to see exactly how I formatted these two files, you can, again, go to the GitHub. There is a document which says, oh, this one. Um, let's see. I just have the... MD here, but um, it no, oh, here we go. It's called zero GSC da 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 data formatting. And it goes through exact every single step I've done to get to the formatted file that we have over here. Okay, so I'm just going to clear this environment over here because we do not want these objects. It's all clear. And we're just gonna go and read this in. Now I've saved it as a text file, which is the most, I won't say common way, but an easier way to transport. Excel files can get huge text files when delimited um, are much easier to share across. So I read that in and this is how our data frame looks like. So each row is a gene. Each of the columns that we have are actual samples. So I've just gone, gone ahead and labeled the IDs as the actual sample name. So it's easier for us. and. Over here, we can see that usually we, sorry, we have whole numbers within our data frame, which is the norm as we would get for any raw expression matrix. If you remember, this is the raw data. On geo or wherever you can go, you can directly get processed data. But given that we want to work through this analysis start to finish, I want to make sure that we know every step that we go through when we actually have our raw data and go to process data. And it's just, Good practice if you're comparing your own data set to these other data sets that you start with the raw data, apply your own parameters so that you know exactly which step is going in and then compare it because process data can be different for every single person who is doing the processing. A little bit of a parameter change here can lead to completely different results. So um, this is what our raw data looks like. And I'm just gonna move this, um, gonna go back in and now just copy this thing, paste it here and name it as PDAT. So P stands for expression data, e uh, expression data, EDAT. P stands for phenotype data, 
um, PDAT. This is just the convention that um, my mentor in the Robinson lab has taught me, and I think that's a pretty good way to go. It makes it very easy to remember the name of um, the actual files we're loading in. So over here, it's again within using the here package, the here function within the data folder, we're using the GSC da 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 PDAT. Okay. And we should get 126. So if you just scroll down, you'll see all of our samples. And then this, these are the different variables that we're working with. Now, just taking a look at this data, can anyone tell me, very easy question, very easy to get a sticker, what is this data set about? What is it, like, what do you think we're looking at here? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay, you get a sticker. Okay, I only have one, two, three, four, five stickers left. Okay, so you're very correct. We have a data set of COVID versus, patients who have COVID versus patients who do not have COVID over here. And it took me a long time to find this data set because a lot of data sets actually only will give you very, very few clinical variables such as age or sex and COVID. Having these other variables is what you're going to usually have in, within your own data, right? You're going to be recording a lot of variables. So I thought to choose a data set which has a lot of variables so you can see how it works like. Okay, so everyone read in the data frames, everything's working good? EDAT, PDAT, everyone? Sure. So what are each one of these values mean? It's in, it's... What is that, so on, what does it mean to have 1.16 that person? 1.16. Okay, so that is basically, again, so this processing, um, when you're actually reading, like aligning your sequences, there is a number of ways you can do with this. So if um, this is paired in data, you can count um, your genes twice because it's running on the forward strand and the reverse strand. So sometimes it might just count in like, no, actually. C is the chromosome? No, C is just a patient ID. Oh, okay. Um, you know what? I've actually haven't seen a 0.16 in just raw data before. It's my it's bad. Yes. Oh no, it is raw. I checked. Something, yeah. Or was it counted by something? Might be, yes. We're assuming these are counts. Yeah. But all over here, you've got a close. Yes. So likely something like salmon was run, and salmon puts out a partial count for a read based on maximum light years. Okay. So does COVID still be Okay. These are, this is not a feature counts count. No, it's not. Yeah. But that's, so these, these values haven't been checked before, but they are not a whole count. Yes. Okay. Yes, that is. Thanks, Phil, for bringing that up because, yes, um, I haven't used, I've only ever used our subbreed, feature counts, um, star and bow tie, which always gives me whole values. And then, as Phil was mentioning, there are quite a few um, that don't actually give you, like, whole values, and they give you partial reads, and that might be something worth looking into. So, my bad. Um, over here. But again, like the one, if you only use the ones that give you whole counts, um, you might not come across this before as I haven't. Okay, so then, um, okay, so we've got all of these loaded in. Now what we're going to do is something called an exploratory data analysis. And um, okay, so it's going to take a look at my notes here. So the first thing we're actually going to do is again, just use like, there's a number of ways you can read in your data. So over here, you know, you can open this data frame, but if you want it within console, of course, you can just do edat, or you could do edat as underscore tibble. You don't have to write 
all of this is just I'm showing you like the different ways. So it's very, very important that you actually get a um, overall sense of what your data looks like. So in that case, what I mean is just, okay, how many, what's, um, what are the type of variables that we have within our actual phenotypic data frame? So we have our like, okay, sorry. So why this is important is that sometimes when we're using a lot of functions, there will be some uh, variables which are actually coded as characters, but are actually numeric. So we need to make sure that the numeric variables are actually numeric. So you just do this like, Oh, I did not do that. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Oh, okay. So what I was saying is like, it's very important to look at how our variables are because there might be a few, like in this case, we do see it's an integer, which is good because it is a numeric value, but there will be some times where numerics are coded as characters. And when you try to do any functions on them, it won't work. So you have to just do all of these checkpoints before. I have already transformed all of the characters into integers or numerics where needed in the formatted data frames. And then um, we can see over here that it's 16 variables. And then we do, let's say we want to get the actual number of um, genes that we have within our EDAT. Now you can obviously open this up. You can look it over here. We know it's 19472, but then dim, the dim function gives you the dimensions of the data frame that you have. So it's 19,000 rows. That means 19,000 genes and 127 columns, um, which is the number of samples that we have. And then I think, um, for our further analysis, we do require that our uh, gene names actually be the row names within this expression data set. Now, that is because sometimes when you're doing of like functions on these data frames, um, character uh, columns are lost, or it just the function just requires you to have a numeric data column. In that case, if you just have your numerics and you don't have your gene column, if something gets shifted, you're not going to know which genes corresponds to which row. So it's just good practice to have it as row names before we start off any function. So we can, we'll probably, we're just going to do this. And then, so we want our column to row names. And then the full function is, so we specify a var or the variable, and then we put in the name of the column that we have, the gene column. So when you do that, you get this. So you have all of your um, genes as row names now. And then just to check, so now you'll see that we have 126 um, columns as well as 126 rows in our EDAT and PDAT. So we want to make sure if the order of the columns matches the rows, because again, that can lead to problems later on. So what we do is call all call names of edat is equal to, um, so over here, we go into pdat, we have our column with the sample names as, labeled as id. I'm just gonna put that, $ID, and there should be, so in R you need to use a double equal to sign to get equal values. And it says true. So that means that everything is in order. If it's not in order, there are a few steps that you can do to put all of those things into order so that you know exactly that column three corresponds to, or like, no. So sample three corresponds to um, row number three in your PDAT. So are we all good up until here? Yes. Is it worth making the row names for your PDAT and the sample? 
Um, yes, we will have we will get into that a little bit later on. But right now, um, PDAT, I like to leave um, without row names because there's quite a few times that we need to condense or widen the data frame. And in that case, we then need to just keep on converting between row names um, and to the column. So, but we will be putting that in a function below. Okay, so then we've done, we have looked at our data a little bit. Now we'll do a little bit of exploration on our phenotypic data. So, so I already have a few things already written here for use because it takes a little bit of time to write down. So it's just easier for everyone. So then um, we're just, again, going, if you want to look at the column names of your, any of your data frames, you just put in names, PDAT, you get all of these. And the reason I use this is because I just, it's much easier to just go like that and copy and put it wherever you want to instead of like writing down everything, you know? Um, and then another thing is when you have a dot in any of the column names you have, it'll only select the word that has an underscore within. So I don't want to select the whole thing. So in general, it's good practice to just have an underscore for everything that you're working with so that whenever um, your work, like you're wanting to select or anything is just so much easier to select everything than a dot. And a dot can also cause problems sometimes. Okay, so then we're going to look at, or we're going to count the number of patients that have COVID versus don't have COVID. So we can also do that a little bit further, like um, what do you call it? You can divide that further and see within each sex, how many patients have COVID and don't have COVID. So for that, I'm just going to do, and you have to match the name of the column exactly, otherwise it won't work. So this is kind of what we get. So we can see that the distribution, like for the patients who don't have COVID is pretty equal. There is one which, we don't know the sex of. And then within the patients which do have COVID, we have a lot more males that have COVID versus less females. Now, this might just be, okay, these are things that you really need to look for because this might just be in sampling error that, you know, they just had more male patients enrolled, or it could just be that there are like males contract COVID a bit more than females. And over here, like, um, do notice that I'm using uh, a binary male versus female for sex, and this is not gender that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Gender is a continuous scale. Um, people should remember that, and you should never code sex as gender because sex is always binary, zero, or one. Okay, so we got a little bit of a lay. Yes. So you usually, like, for every, like, Ron, do you usually call the package and uh, like you usually or just with this layer yes very good question that was actually going to be a question so no stickers but um <laughs> so okay um okay in this case dplyr does have and there's a lot of packages that do have the same named functions and dplyr in general does have a lot of them so deep you'll see over here with select and count I do have deploy written before that because count is a base R function and it depends on the order that you load the packages in. So if you load in tidyverse as the last package you have within your workflow, like library tidyverse, then it'll use count the count function from tidyverse. But if you load it at the start, it might use base R. So it's just always like, and you'll know that the function is not working because it'll just not run. So just, in general, um, there are a few which I know for sure cause problems. So for those, I just write dplyr and then count. But good for bringing that up. Okay, so I just, now that we have by COVID and sex, I want you all to do by COVID and ICU and see what the distribution is. I'll just give a minute. Okay, I haven't run this, but for the people who have, can you tell me how many um, 
patients, no, female patients with COVID were admitted to the ICU? I do not know the answer. How many, oh no, sorry. Um, I don't have, okay, sorry. How many patients with COVID were admitted to the ICU? Okay, let's see. COVID, yes, ICU, yes, 50. There you go, you get one sticker. Okay, don't worry guys, there's lots of chances for stickers later on. Um, okay, so this is kind of what we get and that's true. So we can see that within people who don't have COVID were also admitted to the ICU. That might be due to something different. I don't know, like you'll have to go back. And so there is a paper that I've linked for this study where the data came from. So maybe go back in and see how this actually aligns. Like no COVID, yes, I see you were there just random patients that they took for controls. But then within COVID, we do see, okay, half and half. Okay, so looks to be a 50% probability because it um, looks like, you know, the, it, given that it's like distributed quite equally, there might be that 50% of the people who get COVID might actually be admitted to the ICU. And this is a data set from like very preliminary studies in COVID. It's just like, it just came back and literally at the start of COVID. So things have changed a lot. Just bear that in mind. What we see here might not be a true representation of what we know right now. Okay, so then, okay. So this is um, something that I'm going to ask you to do again. We do have time. So I, so given that you all have worked with, um, again, assuming you have working knowledge of tidyverse, I want you to go into PDAP, look at this, um, where did it go? Oh, sorry, age column over here. And um, I want you to code it as a categorical variable and then actually see um, how many patients, like how, what is the distribution of COVID patients by age? Now, given that you have a continuous value over here, that means that you could get just one value per sample, uh, per age that you have, right? Like maybe there's only one, one patient with uh, age 62. So I want you bracket or bucket age into four separate brackets where age is, um, less than 20, between 21 to 40, 41 to 60, and above 60. So I'll write the brackets down here. Um, and I'll give you five minutes to do this. Um, a hint is you could use the case when function from dplyr. Don't worry, there's no stickers for this, so you don't like, don't feel stressed. Yeah, 
You doing okay? Oh, okay. Colors? Oh, I'm um, getting X's. Yeah. It might just be a bracket. Probably a bracket. Yes. I'm absolutely brand new to this. I don't know. <laughs> Work along as much as you can. Okay, so I think we're going to move on, but this is basically what it looks like. So what I'm doing here is I'm recoding the PDAT variable, meaning I'm replacing PDAT with a new iteration of PDAT. Um, using the mutate function to make a new variable called as age bracket using the case one function to specify that anything um, like any age below 20, um, less than or equal to 20 is going to be coded as below 20, 21 to 40 is 21 to 40, 41 to 60, and then more than 60. So when we run that, and then we do this, COVID and bracket. This is what we get. So if we see uh, people, let's say with COVID, so all of these values, the highest ones we have are, again, above 60. And then we have 41 to 60, and 21 to 40, and then below 20. So it looks like people who have um, COVID seem to be on the higher age range. But then again, that could also mean that, again, it's a sampling error because we have like 56 plus 17 patients above 60. Now that, again, that might be a recruitment criteria for the actual study. Like if they are recruiting COVID patients and COVID patients are indeed at a higher age, then that's kind of what you get. Okay, so we kind of looked at all of this, um, got a little bit of information on how our phenotypic or clinical data looks like. Now what we're going to do, and I've written this here for you, um, we are going to just make a new variable, um, just a new data frame that only has um, COVID as well, uh, like the main variable, as well as the different um, hormones or enzymes or proteins that have been measured for these patients. So again, um, naming the data frame as proteins, I'm using the dplyr select. So select leads you to select specific columns by column name or ID as well, but just to be explicit over here, I've used the column names. And if you run that, you get proteins and all of this information. Now what we're gonna do is make a little plot to see, visualize how does um, the expression of these proteins vary by, co by patients who have COVID and don't have COVID. So what we're going to do now is use a little bit of a advanced function called as pivot longer. And what it does is makes uh, collapses this entire data frame into basically just three columns. So it's easier to plot. So now when you're using ggplot to plot your functions, um, you can basically just pass um, a variable for X, a variable for Y, for color, um, fill, whatever. So you need all of those variables that you want to plot by in one single column. So that's why we use the pivot longer function. Pivot longer is using our job. Um, yes, it is the um, advanced version. So gather and separate have now been deprecated. So that means that they are old functions and have been replaced by these newer functions. Yes. 
So pivot longer and then calls. So you can very, again, explicitly select the names of the columns, but um, given that there's a lot of them, or if you just want to do it by index, I'm just going to do two to six, which means like column number two to column number six. And I'll show you what I mean by collapse. So I'm going to name um, one of the columns. So the columns which are going to have the column names, I'm going to name it as protein and then values. So all of the measurements, I'm just going to label as measurements. When I do that, and I open up proteins again, this is what we get. So for each single um, entry, we now have several different rows and that just is giving you like, okay, so for this patient or this ferritin level, we had this measurement. So it just puts everything into a longer data frame, which is easier to use when you're doing quite a few downstream functions. Um, you can have this, you can, have this as protein long if you want to keep it as a separate data frame and proteins as the original one um, completely up to you and then we're just going to do a very simple plot um, Okay, before I even run this, I'm going to just explain um, very quickly what I've done here is to plot um, COVID on the x-axis, the measurement on the y-axis, so we get the distribution, fill the box plots that we see by the variable COVID, so yes or no, fill in the box plot color as orange or gray for COVID or no COVID, facet drop um, by protein, meaning separate each of the plots by protein, having the y and the x axis as free, so not the same um, for each single plot. That would mean that each plot has each single protein on the x axis, and that just uh, like plotters up the plot, and then applying the theme minimal um, key from ggplot. So, this is what you should all get. And over here, what we're seeing is the distribution of these protein levels by whether the patients have COVID or not. So we do see that there is a little bit of a difference. We do not know if this is statistically significant or not, because for that, we would have to do a test. But just visually, we can see that, yes, the patients who do have COVID um, have a higher CRP, higher ferritin, higher fibrinogen, lower lactate. Doesn't seem to be much of a difference in pro calcitonin but again it might be a difference we just do not know and then we can see the outliers over here and so again this is just a quick and dirty way to get a visualization of the variables that you have okay there are a few things there are a few um other plots so if you look in the completed worksheet there are a few plots that i'm not going to be showing right now because we are running a little behind on time um for the first part so we're just gonna move on to spread of data okay so um what i'm going to do here is again i'm going to convert our the way that we converted our proteins into a longer data frame i'm going to do that the same for edat because that is also required for a few functions so i'm just going to call it elong because it's just either for me, you can call it whatever you want. And then row names to column by genes. You don't have to write the var, you can if you want to. And then this 
going to replace this by calls is equal to, so if I'm using the names of the columns, I can just use minus column genes, names to ID and values to expression. And this is what we get. So our genes are sample IDs and then the expression per gene. And then, um, cause we've already looked at that, but if you wanna have it within your script, just write it there. This is what you'll see. And then, okay. so then now what we're going to do is actually um, plot the density or the distribution that we have of our expression data. And within ggplot, that is a function called as geome density. So ggplot. I do know all of these functions and arguments I'm using. It's just, I don't wanna waste anyone's time. So I'm just literally reading them off. It does, yes. So you can write it in either American or British. Um, yes, I, I'm just used to my um, British spellings. Um, but yeah, ggplot, I think, yeah, ggplot for sure takes, I don't know about the other tidyverse functions though. Um, So again, just uh, explaining that whenever you're trying to plot expression, it's just usually better to do it on a log two scale because, okay, I'll show you what happens when you don't. Hmm. Yes, so this is what you see. Now, this is basically because there are quite a lot of genes that you can see over here that have zero counts or close to zero counts, but then there are also quite a lot of genes that have really, really high counts. So just to like kind of condense that down, um, we just put in a log two argument over here. And then when you do that, Um, it's just your preference. Yeah, no, the thing is I did. So, um, actually good question. When I did do log 10, um, when I ran differential expression, because log 10 condenses it down quite a bit, the number of differential expressed genes that you get is actually just a very, very high, um, like uh, high what, differences, um, that you see. And when it's actually log two, it captures a little bit more of the variation that you see. And I did, I did actually do this. So this is the plot that you get. And we do see a warning over here. The five, like five, 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 four, four, eight, five rows containing non-finite values were removed. That means that values which have a zero within our data frame were removed. Can anyone tell me why we got this error? We have zeros in our expression data frame and ggplot couldn't plot it. Yes, Martin, you're taking all the stickers. Okay, so yes, 
a log two of zero is not a number that you can put. It's not a number, right? So what do you do for that? You simply add a adjustment and oh, not here, over here, over here, log two plus one. So what that does is shift our entire data set to a plus one. So if you have a zero and infinity, it counts it as a zero. So it's able to plot. And it moves our entire data frame to the right, to the positive axis, which means when you plot it now, you get, and it might look completely different. Like over here, it might, yeah, see, there you go. It looks like a completely different plot. So we do see that we have a lot of genes which have zero. We do have a lot of them which have like median values between five to 15, and then they taper off towards 20. It's not a long tail, a little bit of a, but we do have a tail over here, which means that, you know, distribution, like obviously you can see, isn't completely normally distributed. But this is kind of what you would expect from raw data. Raw data is going to give you a very weird distribution, but it's very important that you do get that distribution so you can compare it later on to your process and normalized data. Okay, so what we're going to do is um, we will just save this as an object so that we can use it later on. Then, um, okay, so now we are going to actually look at the sample sample correlation. So how similar are our COVID samples against other COVID samples versus non-COVID versus to non-COVID? Um, that again is something that you should be doing. It's a check. So you have like, you know, two different conditions. How similar are those conditions within that one condition? And when you're comparing against the other condition, is there a big difference or are they actually just similar? So you just use a very simple um, formula called like the our function called the core function, and then just put in our edat. So now over here, this function, the core function requires you to have your genes as row names. It will not work if it has a character column within your data frame. That's why I converted before. So I do sample core. Might take a while if it has a lot of samples. A heat map. You can also do a scatter plot. That might work. Oh, I think I had in my previous reiteration, I had named it this as E melt instead of E long. That's why I have this here. Okay, so SAMCOR is done. And this is what it looks like. Now you have to remember that it doesn't say that it's a data frame, it's a matrix. That is very important to remember because there's a quite a few functions that you cannot apply in matrices and you have to convert them back into data frames. Um, so this is what we have. So you would expect now if you go around and see like um, sample one versus sample one, you get a value of one, which is the highest correlation, which is what you would expect. You're comparing the same sample against the same sample. Then over here, you get sample two versus sample one, and there's a 0 0.92, um, like, don't think this has any units. I don't know, but it's a 0 0.9 um, correlation. And, so then what we're going to do is um, yes. Okay, yes. Now we convert our P dot over here. As Phil had mentioned before, we convert our sample names. So which is the ID column to row names because otherwise it won't run. And then, so what we're going to do, so if I run this without, and not colors, this is what you get. So it's a little hard to look at because the colors are quite jarring. So what we're gonna do is just run this anot calls, which is basically storing each variable you want to have um, within 
like you want to have a specific custom color for as a list. And then within that, so these two are lists within this one object. And for COVID, yes, you have this color. For COVID, no, you have orange. And then I've just given some other colors here. Now, if you run this heat, this heat map here, again, I've written again down all the defaults and the parameters that I think work best for RNA-seq data. You can play around and see which ones you might prefer. Um, the clustering method complete deals well with outliers other um, instead of the war D2 methods. And then Euclidean is just the standard one that you use. And then the P, yes. Yes, there is. So right now we're just using the standard Pearson coloration, but you can also change it to Spearman's correlation. And then when you, sorry? Um, I think, okay. It should be, let's run that. Okay, let's see. So P heat map, if I just put a question mark here, you should get, No, it's going to be a heat map, it's like your sample core. Oh, yes, that's true. Yes, yeah, so over here, yeah. Yes, method. These are the ones you can use. So you can play around with that. So if that solves your um, data set better, I think for DNA methylation or one of the data sets I used, um, Spearman correlation worked best rather than Pearson. Okay, so if you ever want to find something for a function, you just put in question mark, the name of the function, you get that. Then when you run this, this is what you get. So it's a little bit easier to visualize. Obviously you can use your own colors. You can also change the color over here. But what I kind of wanted to tell you is that we do like, usually when you're doing a heat map, you see that samples cluster together. Over here, it doesn't seem like the COVID samples and the non-COVID samples are clustering together. That leads you to an inference that maybe um, the genetic differences that we see over here are not being driven by COVID. They, like having COVID is not influencing the genetic expression that we see to such a high degree that the samples all cluster together. Same is for sex. Um, so the samples do not group by sex. Um, and usually, again, just for my data set, that's what I found. But um, Amy Inkster, who is TAing this workshop, she works with sex as a variable in DNA methylation. And she has seen um, a few differentially expressed methylated positions by sex. So like, it just really depends on the data set that you have. Okay, so then, um, Moving on, so again, you can store it as an object. Um, we are going to go into quality control. So over here, I'm going to be talking about filtering. Now, um, filtering really depends upon the criteria that you want. Do you want the most, do you want to take genes that you know are for like sure expressed? So you just want the genes that, you know, show expression across your data set. Or do you want to build up more of a profile of the genes that you have? Like even if they're lowly expressed, are they expressed? Yes or no? So that really, so the filtering really depends on what you want. I'm going to go through four different filtering criteria um, just to show you how you can apply that to your own data. Like it depends on the question that you're asking. So um, criteria number one. Um, removing sequences with a recount of zero in all samples, meaning that you only can, uh, keep genes which have a recount of one or more in every single sample. So let's say gene number X has a count of three in samples with COVID and has a zero expression with samples who don't have COVID, which means that they're showing expression in COVID patients. But if you do this filtering criteria, that will get rid of that gene because we're only keeping genes which have a count of one or more. So again, it really depends on what you're trying to get at, okay? So then um, EFIL1, just gonna call it EFIL1. We're going to go through fill one, two, three, four. So that's going to be 
we're going to take our E dot data frame. Again, it's a numeric data frame at this point. So um, we are, so if you have it stored, let me see. So we have it stored as row names, uh, genes as row names, but it's much, so sometimes again, like I mentioned, like tidyverse when you're working with the sum functions that you do will get rid of the row names that you have. So we want to make sure that it is within our data frame. So we're going to convert it back into a column. So um, we're going to do row names, column, uh, gene, and then filter. Ooh. So this is the new function that I'm using in dplyr, the if any function. So this, if you've been reading up on the um, advancements that are, like happen in dplyr or just in R, you'll see that um, a lot of the mutate at, filter at have been replaced by the across function. Now this is an extension of that across function. You don't actually use across, but they've just given a new um, function called if any. So we specify only the numeric columns, apply this function only if the column is numeric to all of, to our entire data frame. So the tilde dot X says that the dot X is the entire data frame is more than zero. And then we can convert our columns back to running, just to get it back into the format. So EFIL1, this is what we see now. Can anyone tell me how many genes were filtered out for EFIL1? How many genes did we lose from E dat to EFIL1? Yes, that is correct. Whoever is on Zoom, you get a sticker. Okay. I do have only two left, but I could get some more from my stash. Okay, let's see. Cool. So that is true. So how did you do that? It's very simple. So we do E full one. And we know that dim E dot is 18. So we just copy that minus that and you get one, one, three, two. Okay. So according to you, again, are you willing to lose those many genes? It's totally up to you. Again, depending on the filtering criteria here, we have lost the ones that don't have any counts, uh, don't have a count in every single sample. Yes. So that's the thing. So sometimes when you're using tidyverse, when you're doing any functions, it so happens that whatever is stored as row names gets deleted. So you don't have the row names anymore. Yeah. So just to make sure. It might not happen, but just to be on the safe side. Yes. So then um, what we're going to do is make the same like longer data frame called fill one long. I have the ggplot plot written for everyone, but this one will just... Put this in. So coding or like writing scripts is basic. A lot of copy pasting. Don't waste your time writing everything again. If you have it somewhere in your script, just go up, copy paste it. Um, where did it go? Um, Scheme, same to add e values to expression. So it's exactly like what we did for the earlier raw data frame. Okay. Run that. It's not working. Hmm. 
Ooh. Yes. Okay. Also, sometimes it won't work if this is like indented. So to get this indent back, you just do command or control I and it puts it back right in. Okay. So we have fill one long. And then what we're going to do is um, we can convert the log to, no, now that we have like fill one long here, we have the expression, right? If you want, you could make a separate just variable if it's easier for you to plot it in your plot, like in your ggplot. So we just do it as mutate because I have this log x1 here. So what I've done equal to log two expression plus one, okay? So that's again, our transformation. And if you run this, it should work, no? Oh no, yes, it did because we put it into a object. You don't wanna see that, just run that because I want us to compare it later on over here. That's how it looks like, okay? So I'm just gonna put it back into an object. Filtering criteria number two. Okay, so is everyone with me so far? No, what happened? <laughs> Sorry? It's not too much. Okay, 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 cool. Run like a segment instead of the whole thing. Sorry, that's a Oh yeah, just, just this. Like if you want to just run this line, that what you mean? Yeah. So you could just do this. I think. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But then again, see, because I have the plus one, it won't run. The plus means that there's another argument. So if you just do that, it should come up. Can you highlight it and did you do anything else? Yes. Con command or control plus enter. Yeah, there you go. Uh, what we're doing, okay. mm -hmm. I was just wondering if there's like, how can I find a directory of like all the possible things? I'm just trying to think of like how to connect this to my own stuff. Cause I, I'm just, there's a lot of, uh, I wouldn't know any of these like formulas or the, any of the, uh, like I wouldn't know what to put in. I'm just wondering if like Tigerverse has like They do. Yes, I will show that to you later. Okay, yes. Okay, so we'll move on to efill two. Now, keeping only sequences with a read count of one or more in all samples. So now this was, okay, wait. Um, what did I do? There is a difference. Nikita, I think you have a question online. Yeah. Um, Ali, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Um, can you hear me, Nikita? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, Nikita, filtering criteria one was to remove any value of zero to an expression at zero. But as you mentioned at the beginning, if you have COVID yes three and COVID no zero, so obviously it's uh, wrong to remove those uh, gene expression because you know we will lose that significant data. So is there any way that you can we can define if it is zero in COVID yes and COVID no? Yes, you just jumped to filtering criteria four. I do have that later on, so don't worry. Okay, great. Then uh, then if it is, I mean, uh, how we can say that it is filtering criteria one if it is not a right thing to do? Oh, no, I'm like, just going through the, the different... Zero. Yeah, I've just named them as one, two, three, four sequentially because we're going through them. It doesn't mean that anything is right. I'm just showing you the different ones that do exist. Does that make okay, sense? Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, cool. Okay, so now we're going to keep only sequences with a read count of one or more in every single, in all of the samples. So um, what we're going to do here is um, copy same thing here no from here paste it here and then filter if all I'm going to change it to all is greater than or equal to 1 okay so then this basically only gives us 
um, sequences with a recount of one in every single sample um, for every single G. And we do that. Then, so how many genes now were filtered out for, actually, you know what? I'm not gonna ask this question because you all know how to do it. So I'm just going to move on to eat, like fill long to here. Again, um, all of these like date, um, intermediary data frames that I'm making, you don't have to make them, but sometimes it does happen that you do a function and then you've changed the data frame and you have to run the whole thing again to go back to that data frame. So if you know that you're kind of changing the data frame, just make separate objects. So it's just easier for you to go back whenever you want. So you just copy that. I'm going to go over here. And I'm going to change this to fill two. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly, again, the same thing that we're doing, putting it into an object. Now, yes. Uh -huh. Is there a reason you wouldn't use an average RPM? Like, let's say the mean is zero in all your mm -hmm. case samples and 500,000 in all your controls. Yeah. That means no problem. Yes. So there is, again, there is another um, criteria that you can use. So the one that I'm going to go to for, you can specify the number of samples it might have it in. Also, or you could do is another filtering criteria. It's like, it depends upon, again, if you have a good number of samples within each condition. So for each of those conditions, let's say COVID versus non-COVID, for the COVID, you'll apply filtering criteria one or more in every single sample, keep those sequences, Within non-COVID, apply that same thing. So you won't do it together as well. So it really depends. So in the cancer um, projects that I do, we do it by normal tumor versus whatever other condition we might have. And if they retain within those, we know they're expressed in condition one, two, and three. And those are the genes that we take. So you can very well do it like that as well. So you're criteria, you're yes. 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 Totally off in one sample, but clearly on in another condition. You have to be careful about what you accept. Yes, very true. So that's exactly what I have these four right now. But they're again depending upon the sample type that you have and the data that you have. The questions you're asking are different. So this is what I would apply for my standard workflow. But if I'm looking at something that ha I know clearly, like in cancer, tumor versus normal, I will apply, sep I will separate those two data frames by cancer, non non-malignant, apply the filtering criteria. It has to be the same, of course, across both of them, and then join it to include the genes that are present in each, like both of them. Okay, so then we did fill two. Did we get default two? Yes, we did. Now, keeping only sequences with RPM of two or more. Now, why would, why is that? Like, why would we do one versus two? Because in sequencing, a one count of one can be an artifact that you get. It might just not be an actual expression. So a one is always usually, you know, if you have a gene that's showing a count of one across every single one of your samples, it might be expressed, it might not be expressed. It really depends upon how like the sequencing went, if there was any batch effects, something might go wrong. So one isn't something that I would actually consider as being expressed. So for that reason, a lot of studies actually use a threshold of count of counts of five or more as their baseline for it to being expressed. Again, it depends. Are you wanting to only look at the genes that are, you know are for sure expressed, or do you want to get a profile of all the genes that might be expressed? So the same thing. So we do the whole thing again, where we put in this. So for me personally, I select two or more for my gene expression data set because I want to make sure, because there are a lot of artifacts that can happen with small RNAs. And I want to be sure that the ones that I am counting actually have some true value. So we'll just kind of change this to two. And then fill three. 
go three here. Okay. No. Okay, so I'm going to take this bit out. But can someone tell me how many sequences were removed between E fill two and E fill three? Yes, you get one sticker. Okay, I think you have three stickers, two stickers, 473. Oh no. Okay, I'll check back with Kate. Um, Kate, um, I'll talk to you in the little break that we have just to see that you're on track. Um, but that's what you should be getting, 400 um, and uh, 70. You said 76, right? Yes. So 476. Okay, so yeah, and just good practice with coding. Just write down if you have anything, like, you know, have any comments, any answers, questions, write everything down within your script. You think you'll remember what you did that step for, but you won't. So just explicitly comment and write everything down. Now, this is the one which is a little different. Now, this filtering criteria is keeping only sequences with a read count of more than one in 30% of our samples. Now, this can, again, I like Phil was saying, you can divide your samples into COVID versus non-COVID and do 30% in COVID, 30% in non-COVID, and then join that together. For this purpose, because it's the same steps we will apply to the separate data frames, and they're just going to do it together. So we're going to make a data frame just called as um, RPM more than, okay, can someone tell me what is 30% of 126 samples? Okay, I mean, you, yes, so we will go with 38. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is make a data frame, a, which is going to be a logical data frame, which means that data frame will only contain true or false values. These are also called as Boolean values that actually, I think that explicitly shows you how the data frame looks like. So it's much easier to process it. So RPM more than one is going to be E dot more than or equal to one. Okay. So what we get is a matrix again, but it shows us whether like say for over here, in sample C1 for gene A1CF, the value or the expression is not one or more than one. So that means it's a zero count. If it's more is equal to one or more than one, then we get a true value. So now that we have this, it makes it a little bit easier to code it in a way that we only get 38 for each, we get we only select genes which have a true value of 38 or more. So then um, I'm just going to show you how that looks like. So we actually just saw that. I'm going to do table, row sums. And so this is what we see. So this is showing us that we have 107, sorry, 1,172 sequences where all samples have an RPM of less than one. And um, we have 11860 samples, no, genes, which have a value of one or more in all samples. Now, if you remember, this is a value that we have already gotten in the past. So this, I think we got for EFIL2, which is we said we want to value one or more in our filtering criteria, right? So that's a good sanity check that, okay, this is working as it should, the um, uh, parameter, the functions that we've applied for this data frame are what we want to be getting. Okay, so now 
what we're going to do is only select the ones that have a um select the genes which only have values no select samples sorry <laughs> we're going to select the ones which have rpm more than one and at least 30 percent of the samples so we'll call this efill4 um copy this here now remember that this is a matrix so the downstream functions won't work we have to convert it to a data frame um, put in a new column called sum, which is the row sums of every single um, column that we're looking for so that the dot specifies all, all or everything. And then the fire select sum and everything. So what I'm saying here is that make a column called sum, which will um, sum up all of the true values that we have for each of our genes, then the dplyr select is to select the column. So in this case that I'm using it as a reorder function to select the sum column as the first column. So it's easier for us to visualize. And then everything meaning use a sum column and then put all of the rest of the columns after that column. And this is how it would look like. So we see that AB1 a1bg has all of its samples with a read count of one or more, which is great. So now it's just a simple method of just simple step of just filtering on that sum column. Greater than or equal to 38. And then we are only going to select um, so now, okay, now we have this. We don't actually have the gene expression values, right? So we need to go back to EDAT and pull out the genes from the EDAT column to get us the actual expression values. So we do that by And then we use this special function called in that only pulls out the things that we're wanting it to. Okay, should work. Now we get EFIL4. Perfect. So we get a raw data back, like to the genes that we actually wanted. Is that making sense? Yeah, okay, C nodes, that's good. Then we do the same thing again. We're here. Sorry, can you explain again mm -hmm. how you filter through? Okay, sure. So what I did over here is I said to e that that I only want to pull the um, row names that are present in this column. So this is our, no, not this one. Okay, I've written over that data frame, but basically the RPM uh, more than one that we got, right? We got all of our Boolean values. Um, so this is the unfiltered one, but this is what we got. And then for the ones that we selected within that saying that, okay, these are more than 38, we only had these true or false values. So we wanted to pull out the actual gene expression count. So I told um, the function I use is filter. So that, which means filter by row to select the row names in EDAT, which match the row names in our filtered efill for. Yeah, okay. Um, you can do that for columns as well sometimes, like when you need to. Okay, so we did that, G4. Now, this is the fun part. We get to see how our expression distribution is with all of these four different um, filtering functions. Um, it might take a while because there's quite a lot of plots. Okay. 
Okay, so this is what it looks like. These are our four different filtering functions. And um, over here, I've in the subtitles, I've added exactly which filtering criteria we've used. So this should be two. Um, but you can see like within the one and the two, it doesn't look that different. But as soon as we start filtering this expression, like um, the distribution does change quite a lot. The 30% actually, you can see that there's a peak at the zero because we did keep, like we do have a lot of the samples that have zeros within those genes because we selected of more than 38. Okay, is this clear? Like everything working at this point? Okay, now we're moving on to the last step, which is normalization. Now, um, I won't be going into the explanation of what normalization is, why it is important. You can go off and read that on your own, but I'm just going to show you um, what the standard normalization techniques that I apply. And, okay, so we are going to use it should already be installed, the edge R package. And we're going to actually make a separate um, value called genes, which is, okay, so within this basically, um, because I said, you know, we select the one, I select the ones which are um, usually um, read count of two or more, which is the GFIL3, or the field three, but for the purposes of this example, I'm just going to go with one. I'm going to be a little less stringent. So I'm going to say row names of e fill, e fill two. So that means we get a object that gives us all of the row names within the filter data set that we actually want. Then, I'm going to say this is the actual function to run the normalization set. I'm going to say counts is our efil2 data set. So that's the filter data set of RPM of one or more than one. Samples is equal to pdat, which means that we already have pdat case IDs um, as row names. So it's just going to pull in that. Um, and then the genes that we want to use are the genes that we specified here. It needs, even if we have it as a data frame here, it still requires a separate argument. And then I'm going to use the group function, which lets it very specifically know that I'm looking for differences between COVID and not. This is an optional step. You don't have to use it. I usually don't because um, I'm just trying to normalize it as a whole and not versus condition. But if you want to, you can use this one. So that's what I run. And then this is some, this is kind of what you get. So it's like a list with a few data frames. And then this, um, further function is something which is give, going to give you the actual count. So it says, um, sorry, let me just write it. Okay, so what this is telling is to make a data frame called enorm um, and calculate the normalization factor. So these normalization factors are basically numeric values that will either be added to or subtracted to from the raw data frame. And then the adjusted values that you get is a normalized data frame. And you're going to apply it to the norm object that we made from this DG list command. And the method of normalization is RLE. Now over here, you can change it to TMM normalization. You can change it to quantile. You can use interquartile, whatever you want. Depends on you. This is very dependent on your project and the type of analysis that you're doing. So I'm going to use RLE. Um, I'm going to run that now. RLE is a within sample normalization method. This means that we haven't actually accounted for a library size within each of the samples. So standard way of doing this is just counts per million scaling. So you can just apply that to your enorm. And now we see 
E norm is a matrix and we do not want that. There we go. This is our normalized data frame. Now you can see that these are not whole numbers as before, but what we get is decimal like numbers in decimals as well. This is because if you look at the calc norm factors, which uh, there is a way to pull this out. I think it's this one. Okay, no. But um, if you actually look at the calc norm factors, which you get, it is a, again, it's not a whole number. So when you add or subtract a decimal, you're obviously going to get a decimal value. It's not going to be a whole number. So in this case, what we're going to do is actually, um, okay, I'll think I'll turn, okay. So we're going to convert it back into um, you can okay, so you can do this separately as a and call it like a log two e norm or just overwrite it. I usually just overwrite it because now, given that we have normalization, we do have a few entries which have zeros within them. So we need to, again, do the log two plus one to make sure that we get the whole numbers. And I am going to, okay. Okay, this is not how I have it written within my script, but we're at 11, so I don't want to hold anyone too long. Um, so we have it converted into this. And now if I just run this again. So... And then I have um, I have this here, genes, and I run that. Um, Nikita, while it runs, um, Suresh had a very good question in the chat. She's asking if um, if the data is not normally distributed, can you do a non-parametric approach instead of normalizing? Uh, so I answered that yes, overall, but if you want to expand on that, because it might be of interest to other students. Yeah, so that's the thing. So you might, even after normalizing, you might not get a normalized, like, you know, a normal distribution. In that case, again, it depends upon the further steps that you're going to apply. So usually um, if you have read literature and if you've seen that with a big enough sample size that the, norm, the data does become normalized, you can apply parametric methods. But if you don't actually have an idea of how the data would look like if you had more samples, um, then I might go for a non-parametric test because at some point all data is going to become a normally distributed curve, right? So it really depends upon again, like how comfortable are you saying that if I had more samples, would I go like, um, would I have a normally distributed data set? Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So 
this is not running. I don't know why. Okay, you know what this should, it's basically the same exact command from over here. We have the data frame in the same exact, um, okay, wait, no, what did I do? Yes. Okay. Maybe just mention for those that have the rug that the build up are hard to allocate. Yes. So, exactly. So, if you go to the, uh, I'll stop sharing and I'll just show you basically what it looks like. Um, oh, yeah. It just came up. <laughs> but, um, okay, wait. Let me. So you should see that. So this is the completed worksheet for part number one. And if you scroll down, you'll see that what I'm doing over here is, this is the normalized data frame data that we see. It's pretty good, normally distributed, happy with that. But most likely you will not be getting this and that's okay. But, and then over here, I just show you how the raw data with like literally what we download from geo looks like versus our normalized data. And um, safe to say it looks much better. And then over here, this is basically kind of a homework or something to uh, you can do on your own, which is basically to see that you take out a random gene. I use the trim two gene. And I see that when I actually plot raw versus normalized counts for each single sample, we can see that the raw counts are all over the place, right? And it shows us what normalization does is to actually bring it together in a cohesive manner and condense it down so that we can actually compare it to each other sample for all of the other genes that we see. So it's just a visual uh, interpretation of what normalization does. And at the end, once we have that E norm, just put it into row names to column. So make sure you have explicit column for gene and then just save that file. If you have the repo, you should already have the e-norm, but um, if not, that's what you should like, just save it in within your data folder, say e-norm text. And in an hour, we will start our exploratory analysis with our normalized data. Okay, that's it. That's it for part one.